Eh, feliz Navidad, hermanos y hermanas. Bienvenidos al seminario virtual de Seminario Teológico Berit y Escuela de Posgrado de Berit. Nos sentimos honrados y agradecidos por estar con todos ustedes. Y damos gloria a nuestro Padre Dios por permitir este seminario. Oro para que todos ustedes reciban una bendición y comprensión increíbles de la Biblia con nuestro seminario. Nuestro Dios es mayor que todos, más grande que todos. Esto está escrito en Juan capítulo 10, 20, versículo 29. Nuestro gran Dios quiere trabajar a través de todos ustedes para dar vida eterna a quienes escuchan y comprenden la palabra de Dios. Y el Seminario Teológico de Berit es un seminario donde se aprende profundamente solamente la palabra de Dios para dar vida a nuestras iglesias, familias, amigos, vecinos y a los que están muriendo en este mundo. Así que únete a nosotros en el viaje que Dios ha preparado para su gloria. El viaje que recorrieron nuestros antepasados en la Biblia para cumplir la voluntad de Dios, el pacto de Dios. Damos la bienvenida a todos una vez más. Y antes de comenzar con el seminario, Oremos primero. Vamos a orar. Nuestro Padre Dios, realmente te agradecemos por tu amor y gracia con este día de Navidad. Es un día que usted vació totalmente. Vino a salvar a toda la humanidad. Ayúdenos a adorar al Rey de Reyes con gran alegría. Y que esta Navidad sea un día bendecido para que podamos ofrecer el mejor regalo a usted, que es la fe. También te agradecemos por traernos hermanas y hermanas, hermanos y hermanas, a este seminario para escuchar la palabra de Dios. Oramos que esta palabra sea plantada en sus corazones para que dé buenos frutos para el Señor en el año 2021. También oramos para que el doctor Warren Gates sea lleno de Espíritu Santo mientras predica la palabra hoy, para que podamos recibir grandes bendiciones, que es la gran fe, gran obediencia y, gran, y el gran gozo a través del mensaje. Que estés con nosotros a través del seminario, te damos gracias y oramos en el nombre de Jesús. Amén. Bienvenidos otra vez. Uh, ahora, uh, Sandra Osorio uh, nos presentará la serie de la historia de la redención. Sandra. Buenas tardes, buenas noches en algunas partes del mundo. Mi nombre es Sandra Osorio. Uh, soy miembro de la iglesia Evergreen de la ciudad de Nueva York. Tuve el privilegio de conocer al pastor Abraham Park en el año 2010. Desde entonces he estado, con, he estado estudiando la historia de la redención. Esta me ha dado un conocimiento más profundo de la palabra. Me ha enseñado a, a conocer más a mi padre. Y no solamente a mi padre, me ha enseñado a conocer estos personajes bíblicos que antes a lo mejor eran lejanos, pero ahora los he podido aprender a conocer de una forma más profunda, más íntima. Eh, el tema de la historia de la redención o el versículo lema de la historia de la redención es de Deuteronomios 32.7. Eh, lo va a leer rápidamente, eh, dice, acuérdate de los tiempos antiguos, considera los años de muchas generaciones, pregunta a tu padre y él te declarará a tus ancianos y ellos te dirán. A través de la historia de la redención he podido comprender que para poder entender la, la, la Biblia, entenderlo por venir, entender las cosas que el Señor tiene uh, para nosotros, esos tesoros escondidos que hay en la palabra, tenemos que volver al principio, tenemos que ir y preguntar, a nuestros padres, a nuestros ancianos, a, 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 los, a nuestros padres de la fe. Y ha sido de gran bendición 
poder a, interactuar con ellos a través de la palabra y conocer la profundidad de la palabra a través de ellos, conocer al Padre a través de ellos. Y eso es lo que deseamos para ustedes en esta, en esta tarde y a través de este seminario, a través del Instituto Berit. Permítanme hablarles un poco acerca del pastor Abraham Park, el fundador. Eh, podemos decir que la serie de la historia de la redención son los frutos del reverendo Abraham Park. ¿Pero quién es el reverendo Abraham Park? Él fue ministro y autor de la serie La Historia de la Redención. Es reconocido mundialmente, quien leyó la Biblia más de 1,800 veces. Él oraba un periodo de dos, dos horas al día y leía la Biblia por un periodo de tres horas cada día. Un verdadero ministro. Dios lo llamó al reino de los cielos el 17 de diciembre del año 2014. Con el comienzo de su ministerio, eh, en el comienzo de su ministerio, él anhelaba entender la Biblia y por esta razón subió al monte Jiri, monte más alto de Corea. Ahí, en una pequeña cueva, estuvo leyendo la Biblia durante el día y durante la noche oraba. Y le, él hizo eso por un periodo de tres años, seis meses y siete días. La iglesia principal de Corea, Pianganchel, tiene 80 mil miembros en este momento y ha establecido más de 100 iglesias hermanas alrededor del mundo. Después de 50 años, las, después de 50 años la serie La Historia de la Redención ha publicado su primer libro eh, llamado Las Genealogías del Génesis en el año 2007. Y desde el año 2007 hasta el año 2019 se, eh, se publicó el undécimo libro Jehová Sama, Templo de Ezequiel. Los libros están traducidos en 20 idiomas, incluyendo el lenguaje hebreo. Y, así, y se han hecho más de mil seminarios en más de 200 ciudades y 45 países alrededor del mundo. Esta, esta palabra, la historia de la redención, todo lo que eh, les he hablado en este momento es lo que queremos compartir con ustedes. Es la palabra, es la palabra de Dios, la palabra que la podemos entender y comprender respaldada con la misma palabra de Dios y de eso se trata la serie La Historia de la Redención. Así que les doy la bienvenida y deseo que el conocimiento que nosotros hemos recibido a través de ella lo puedan recibir ustedes también. Dios lo ben los bendiga grandemente en este día. Gracias. Y gracias, Sandra. Uh, ahora tenemos a Carlos Osorio desde Colombia que nos presentará al orador. Okay, Carlos. Estudiando la historia de la redención desde hace unos ocho años, pertenezco también a la iglesia Evergreen de la ciudad de Nueva York. Mi, mi trabajo en la iglesia básicamente ha sido la traducción de los textos del inglés al español. En ese momentico voy a presentarles a darles una breve reseña sobre eh, nuestro decano en el, en el Seminario Teológico Berit. Él es el doctor Warren Gage. Su historia empieza en el año 1975. Allí obtuvo una licenciatura en Historia Alemana y Europea en la Universidad Metodista del Sur. Allí obtuvo un premio que se llama Summa Cum Laude, que es otorgado por la Sociedad Honoraria Pi Beta Kappa, es como los máximos honores. En el año 1975 también obtuvo la maestría en teología, en teología semítica y antiguo testamento. Allí estudió con el doctor Bruce Wolk. El doctor Bruce Wolk es un importante erudito del antiguo testamento. En ese mismo año obtuvo el premio Jenny Solomón del Antiguo Testamento, que es también un gran honor. En el año, entre 1979 y 1980, él realizó estudios bíblicos de posgrado en la Sociedad Honoraria Pi Delta Pi de la Universidad Tübingen en Alemania. En el año 1987 obtuvo el doctorado en jurisprudencia en la Universidad Metodista del Sur, en la Escuela de Derecho Deadman. Y allí vamos a 1995, cuando obtuvo una maestría en filosofía política clásica. 
y en el año 2001 obtuvo un doctorado en filosofía, filosofía y literatura de la Universidad de Dallas. Su experiencia, digamos, laboral empieza entre el 2002, empezó en el 2002, entre el 2002 y el 2014 fue pastor asistente, pastor adjunto en la iglesia presbiteriana de Coral Ridge. Eh, entre el, en el mismo periodo, entre el 2002 y el 2014, él estuvo en el seminario teológico Knox. Allí fue profesor y decano de Antiguo Testamento. Fue decano de esa facultad. Fue director también del programa de cristianismo y de estudios clásicos. Eh, en el año, desde el 2014 hasta hoy, él ha sido el presidente del Foro de Alejandría. Y actualmente es, como ya lo dijimos, es el decano académico del Seminario Teológico Bérica. El doctor Warren Gates ha escrito varios libros. Creo que unos 12 libros, vamos a citar algunos 12, 14 libros. Entre ellos, La Historia de José y Judá, el romance de la redención, el evangelio del Génesis, la visión de Juan de la ciudad celestial, el banquete celestial, hitos de Emaús, regreso de Emaús, el camino a Emaús. No hay mayor amor como Jesús, es más grande que todos los que vinieron antes que él. Poética teológica, tipología, símbolo y el Cristo y ensayos de la teología bíblica. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Uh, ahora uh, vamos a invitar al doctor Warren Gage para que comparta con nosotros el mensaje titulado El Evangelio en la Historia de la Natividad. Que todos reciban grandes bendiciones a través del mensaje. I'd like to uh, look to the very famous Christmas message from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful account of the birth of the Savior of the world. And uh, I, I want to talk specifically about the sign that was given by the angels to the shepherds. What is the meaning of that? Why was the sign, and a sign signifies something, what, what is being signified? They were told that they would be able to identify the baby because he would be wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Why a manger? So I want to give some thought to that. One of the interesting things about uh, Greek iconic art is the convention that whenever they depict the Christmas, uh, they uh, have the, the child lying in a manger, stone box, and looking into the manger are an ox and uh, a donkey. And that's uh, whenever you see a, a Christmas scene from uh, the Eastern Church, the most ancient church, that is the way they depict it. And it occurred to me after noticing that, that that is really based upon the opening uh, verses of the prophet Isaiah. And uh, specifically, uh, the Lord is lamenting the disobedience of Israel and how they had been forgetful of him. And so uh, he says through the prophet, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up my children, and they have rebelled against me. And then he says this, very interestingly, The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know me, and my people do not consider. What an interesting verse, and the convention from the earliest centuries has been to depict the ox and the uh, donkey uh, looking into the crib and seeing the master of Israel, that is the Christ. So I'd like to look at Luke chapter 2, and I want to read through the passage, but 
Specifically, I want to consider the sign that was given to the shepherds. Luke tells us it's a sign, and so we want to understand, well, what did the sign signify? If we can uh, unravel that mystery, that will really help us to understand the, the narrative of the birth of the Savior and to appreciate the ministry of Jesus in, I think, a far deeper way than perhaps we have seen it so far. So the evangelist writes, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, swaddling bands. Uh, that's significant. Uh, I want to talk about that in a moment. Swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And that is, they had found shelter uh, at the night uh, from uh, in a stable. Uh, where animals were, and they had no crib, and so they made do with a manger. Now, what is a manger? Uh, and what, is this, what does this mean, swaddling clothes? In most of the world, still, they wrap newborn babies in bands or strips of cloth. They wrap them tight. They wrap them with their uh, arms across their chest or uh, strictly down by their side, and they wrap them uh, tight uh, like a mummy. It's almost like a presentation of a body at death, uh, where they also uh, typically wrap in linen uh, wrappings. And a manger is not like we in the West or, uh, or see in our Christmas creches, our Christmas scenes, where the manger is typically a triangular piece of um, two pieces of wood that are attached like this, filled with hay. That's, uh, that's not the way that a manger would have been understood in the New Testament. Now, um, what, what would they have understood? In the, the archaeological area is called Syro-Palestine. Uh, they have a very similar archaeology, and a manger in the ancient East is not made out of wood. Uh, that's very normal in Europe where wood is plentiful, but it wasn't quite as plentiful in Christ's time. And they were far more practically minded anyway, and so they made mangers out of limestone blocks. They were blocks of stone. And uh, uh, so I have uh, a picture of some mangers that, that I took in um, Megiddo in Israel. And we can see that the pictures, these are from the stables of Ahab at Megiddo. And we can see very clearly that it is a box-like structure uh, hollowed out of limestone. And they would put the feed for the animals in the manger. It's a feeding trough. The, the English word manger comes from the French manger, which means to be hungry. It's a place of feeding. And so it's feeding the animals. And that will be significant, as we will see. The baby, uh, wrapped in swaddling bands, I think is, is nicely illustrated by, in the presentation at the temple by Giovanni Bellini, this, uh, this beautiful picture of the uh, Christ child. And so to imagine the scene that the shepherds would see, we have to Im imagine a baby wrapped in swaddling bands uh, sleeping, perhaps, and lying safely and comfortably, but in this, this uh, stone uh, structure. That is the scene that we must keep in mind, and that will reimagine, in many ways, the Christmas story for us. So let's, uh, let's go further into the text, now picking up at verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. The shepherds in the first century were pretty much disregarded. Uh, they 
kept the flocks, but uh, they were not able doing that necessarily to keep kosher law. They weren't necessarily able to participate in all the festivals that were appointed. And so they were regarded as uh, very low class and, um, and, and all. And so they're watching over their flock uh, to protect them in the evening time. But this night in Bethlehem, the first Christmas, is very special. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Good tidings is the word for gospel. This glorious announcement from heaven is coming to these people that are disregarded, that are not considered uh, among the noble people of the land. But heaven uh, regards them as such. These are pastors. Uh, the Latin word, uh, the Greek word is poimen for shepherd. The Latin word is pastor, and we use that word to describe uh, ministers of the gospel. They oversee a flock. And so the Lord, who is the good shepherd, uh, dispatched his angels to announce his birth to these uh, lowly shepherds who were faithfully watching over their flocks. And the angel, uh, the angel's appearance uh, frightened them, but the angel came with a word, fear not. I bring you good tidings, it's a word of gospel, and great joy which shall be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What a glorious message that is. And this will be the sign to you. Well, how will we identify this, um, this newborn baby there in the fields of Bethlehem, which had been... Uh, a thousand years before the fields of Boaz, uh, where Ruth had gleaned. And those fields <coughs> have now become shepherd's fields. And so they, are, they have this visitation of angels, and the angels give them a sign. The sign signifies something, so we need to try to figure out what is that sign. This is the sign given to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. That's how they will identify this one particular Christ child from all the other babies. Now, if we think about that for a moment, you will see the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's not necessarily uh, enough of a distinction because we presume there were numbers of newborns who were wrapped in swaddling clothes. The tightness of that binding uh, uh, it, it comforts the child because they had been constricted in the, in the womb of their mother. And coming out into the world, they uh, are comforted and it helps them to sleep, to tie them up tightly and to bind them. So there would be numbers of babies wrapped in swaddling clothes, but the real differential by which they will recognize that this is the child of whom the angel spoke and, and, and said that this was the Savior Christ, the, the Messiah, the sign is that he would be lying in a manger because we can reasonably presume that uh, this makeshift cri shift crib was the only, this was the only child that was lying in a manger uh, so positioned. So um, we still need to consider well, what is the significance of that and we'll speak to that in a moment. Now suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So angels come from heaven announcing glorious good news. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. That's when they realized that this is the child whose birth the angels had foretold. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. That is, they went out with great joy and told everyone. Uh, it's a, a telling of the gospel. They had been told from a visitation by heavenly angels that the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, has been born. And all these who, those who heard it marveled. They wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So that is the first Christmas, and what a glorious message that we still remember and um, uh, proclaim with great joy for all the earth. 
Now, the significance of the sign to the shepherds I want to look at, and that is if we consider the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in this stone box, what would be the, the re reaction of the shepherds when they came into the stable where the Holy Family was, what would they have seen? And I think the striking thing is that the baby in swaddling clothes is wrapped up like a mummy, which is uh, interesting, uh, mummy form, but he is lying in a crib that's not made out of something that's comfortable, it's made, uh, it's made out of stone. It looks like, very much looks like an ossuary, which is a bone box uh, or a little mini sarcophagus. So the idea as they walk in, as they look at this child, and the first impression that they would be given is that, my goodness, this child has been born but has died. Uh, the shock of that would have been, I think, fairly remarkable because that's clearly what is intended. And then they look carefully at the child and they see that although he has all of the aspects and characteristics of death around him, as they look more closely, they can see that he is breathing quite comfortably. He is alive. He is not dead. And I think th there is a tremendous sign in that. The sign is that this is the child who is born to conquer death, to go through death, and have all of the uh, aspects of actual, literal, clinical death, but he will also live, and that anticipates the resurrection. And so no wonder they went out and told everyone with great joy that the child had been uh, born, that uh, Israel had been longing to see the, the one who would become the Messiah, the seed of the woman, born of the virgin, uh, who would be the redeemer of the world. And I think that is wonderful and marvelous. The sign that was given to the shepherds by which they would know this is truly uh, the, the savior of the world. Now, I want to put that in a broader context because the visual imagery of that scene is very dramatic as it anticipates uh, another time in the life of the Savior when he would be wrapped in linen bands and laid in a uh, tomb carved out of rock. There is a beautiful symmetry to the life of the Savior. Typically, we find that things that God has made that are beautiful are, are in symmetric order. There is, there is a clear pattern in order. If we think of the human body, we can imagine the body divided by the meridian, the line down the middle, and those uh, organs that we have that are singular are on that meridian so that we, and those that are on either side, are doubled. So we have two ears and two eyes. We have one nose, although it has two nostrils. We have one mouth, and so we think all the way down, we have two hands and arms and two legs. There is a symmetry uh, that God has made to the human body. And when we think of the way that he creates, uh, everything is made full and whole. Uh, there is a symmetry to the way that God designs, and there's a, there's a fundamental balance and proportion to that which is beautiful uh, that's well known. Uh, there's a whole study, science of aesthetics and what we find to be beautiful. One of the things that I find to be tremendously beautiful is you know, obviously the most beautiful thing ever given to us is the life of Jesus, and there is a tremendous symmetry to the life of the Lord in that his birth anticipates his resurrection in a very striking way. And it's clear that the circumstances of his birth are written in such a way that we are to understand um, and we're to foresee the circumstances of his suffering uh, death. The, um, let's consider this for a minute and how Jesus his birth foretells his uh, resurrection. Uh, the birth story of Jesus is told primarily through the eyes of a Mary and a Joseph, Mary of Nazareth and Joseph, of course, of Bethlehem. Now, to the modern reader, 
uh, we don't put much store by names, although we should because the names are prophetic. And um, the remarkable thing about the birth of Jesus, that we, we witness it primarily through the eyes of Mary and Joseph, is the account of the resurrection of Jesus is primarily told to us through the eyes of a Mary and a Joseph. Uh, that's significant. Only this time it's Mary Magdala and Joseph of Arimathea. When we think about that, it's part of the symmetry of the life of the Lord that makes it, that there is a loveliness and a beauty to his life and a prophetic significance that is absolutely wonderful. The principle, uh, when, when, the, when these words and oracles and letters and, and gospels were written for first century uh, people, recipients, they understood in the ancient world the significance of the name. The Latin phrase for that is nomen est omen. The name itself was considered to be prophetic. And so even though these are two totally different Marys and two totally different Josephs, the fact that the narrative of the birth and the narrative of the resurrection are told through their eyes is significant. They're very contrastive. Mary of Nazareth is uh, pure. She is a virgin. Uh, Mary of Magdala had been uh, defiled by seven demons, and she loved the Lord tremendously, which is the measure of her awareness of being forgiven. Some, at some point that is not reported to us, the Lord had met her and had cleansed her of these seven uh, demons, and she loved the Lord with all her heart. So we see that with Mary, uh, his mother, there is a purity. With Mary Magdalene, there is a purity that's been restored to her. With Joseph of Bethlehem, we know he is very poor, uh, the um, earthly father of Jesus. Uh, in the sacrifice of the purification, he will offer the two turtle doves, which, which is an indication that, that the Lord's parents were very poor. But Joseph of Arimathea, on the other hand, is, is very rich and prominent. So it's like these two pairs that through whom the uh, birth and, and death and resurrection narrative of Jesus are told, talk about the entire embrace of the gospel. It is for those who have been defiled by sin. It is those who uh, maybe have not, have, have some measure of purity, although we are all sinners. But it is also um, for the uh, rich and for the poor, the gospel has an embrace for everyone, and I find there's a beautiful symmetry in the, in the embrace of the gospel. There is, a, there is another correspondence that's quite striking, and that is that Jesus is born from a virgin womb. When Mary is told that she will conceive in her womb, she asks the angel Gabriel, how can this be? She says, for I have not known a man. Uh, no man has lain with her. And of course, the angel tells her that uh, she will conceive by the Holy Spirit so that when she gives birth, uh, that child, his only father, will be uh, God himself. So Mary is a virgin. Uh, the Lord will come forth from a womb where no man had lain. But when we come to the account, when we come to Luke's account of the resurrection, he makes it very explicit that Joseph of Arimathea laid Jesus after he had been wrapped in these um, uh, linen bands, uh, according to the Jewish custom of burial. He laid him in a tomb carved out of rock where no man had lain. It's very interesting language. Uh, it means that the tomb had not been defiled by death on one hand. On the other hand, he uses the language of virginity. And the, so the question that arises is, well, what man can come forth from a virgin womb? And no man can, in the natural order of things, come forth from a virgin womb. That's the supernatural uh, power that is being manifested. The same thing is true of, uh, of the tomb. What man can come forth from a tomb? Well, not in the natural world, but there is a supernatural power in Jesus. He has the power of an indestructible life, and so he is able to come forth from, uh, from uh, the tomb of death. It's like Jesus has so much life in him that he's able to come forth from the womb of a virgin, but he can also come forth from the tomb uh, in his power over death. In both of them, at his birth and in his burial, Jesus is wrapped in swaddling bands. He is made to appear like a mummy in his birth, and he will be wrapped in the shroud bands in his, 
death, and he will be placed in a rock uh, hewn manger in his birth, like an ossuary or sarcophagus, and he will be placed in a tomb cut out of rock, Luke tells us. And interestingly, both things are equated in the Bible. The manger is obviously a borrowed uh, manger. Uh, they had no property entitlement to it. It is a borrowed manger um, that uh, Jesus' parents, it's a makeshift, uh, make-do kind of a manger. But he's placed immediately in a borrowed manger. In his death, he will be placed in a borrowed tomb. There is, a, again, this beautiful symmetry in, in all of that. And in both accounts, both in his birth and in his resurrection, angels come from heaven announcing good news. And at his birth, they announce good news, the peace on earth. And his resurrection, they come announcing good news. Uh, the best news that could ever be heard with, by human ears is he is not here, as the angel said. He is risen, as he said, the promise that uh, there is life after death. That is the promise that, that we have. In, um, and then, in remarkably, there, there, there's another symmetry as well, and that is that the angels come to announce to the shepherds um, of Israel that there is a sign given to them. They will recognize that he is living. He has now been born, and he is living by the sign, and the sign, of course, is the swaddling bands and the rock-hewn manger. And they will go out, these shepherds, all over telling people the glorious good news that heard from heaven that the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, the, the, the seed of the woman, the, uh, the shepherd of Israel, the Holy One of Israel has been born to redeem the world. And the people will marvel at that message, which is, uh, which is the gospel uh, in, in, in its essence. The one has been born who will overcome death and the grave. And in his resurrection, uh, Jesus, uh, we know from the Gospel of John, is very careful to take the face cloth that was over him, to fold it in a particular way, and to leave it there along with the grave clothes um, that, uh, the, that will be at the place where he lay, that uh, the angels will marvel concerning. And we know that providentially, uh, Peter and John ran to the tomb when they heard the report of the women. Uh, unlike the others, they had heard something that prompted them to run to the tomb. Uh, when, the angel, when, when Mary and the women came back and said they'd seen angels, they describe them as wearing ostrope, which is, which is the shimmering star. It's based on the word star, the star kind of clothing. And Peter and John knew the great secret because they had been at the transfiguration of Jesus, uh, which they had been instructed not to tell anybody. And so they, but they looked at each other, I'm sure. And when they heard that word, they wondered what was, what was going on because they had seen Jesus clothed in ostrope in the transfiguration. So that accounts to me for why they left the company of all the others when they heard the report of the women and they ran to the tomb to see what, uh, what was going on. And when they come, and remember, these are the ones appointed to be the shepherds in Israel, but uh, they have failed. Peter has actually denied the Lord three times and wept bitterly over, in repentance over his great sin. John, too, had left uh, in Gethsemane, had abandoned the Lord. Um, he summoned up his courage when he uh, did go to the cross with Jesus' mother to comfort Jesus' mother. But uh, nonetheless, both of them had, had an acted in ways that were unbecoming. And so um, the question is, well, God had called them to be shepherds. Will they, will they, will they yet be the shepherds in Israel? Uh, having failed so miserably, and the church, I don't believe, would have ever accepted the apostles had the Lord himself not restored them, but Peter particularly. And John tells us in chapter 1, he devotes an entire chapter largely to the restoration of Peter, uh, who, when he heals Peter of his, uh, uh, re and redeems him from his three denials by three times asking him, Peter, do you love me? And, and uh, Peter responding that he does, and he knows he loves him. And he says three times, Peter, do you love me? And he's walking him back through his three denials. And Peter is publicly proclaiming his his uh, love of the Savior the last time 
uh, with uh, tears. And you know, all things you know that I love you. And he's always saying, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my lambs. The Lord himself is restoring Peter and making him a shepherd in Israel. And that's John's account of the restoration of Peter. But when we come to, and it's Peter and, and the other apostles with them, but when we come to Luke's account, Luke, Luke describes the restoration of Peter and John in a very different way. And how is that? He describes them coming to the tomb in uh, Luke 24, verse 12. And uh, he says that they, they, uh, they go to the tomb and they see the grave clothes, the, the, the uh, shroud bands of Jesus uh, lying in a rock-hewn tomb. And so what, whether they realized it at that moment or not, I don't know, but certainly Luke did. He recognizes that God had given Peter and John the sign of the shepherds. And they would go forth marveling. It's at that point that they believe. They don't understand completely, but they, they believe that Jesus uh, has been raised from the dead. And they go forth and they are being prepared to be sent out to tell the whole world that God has sent his Christ to conquer death itself and to offer us the gospel, the good news, that we need not fear death because the Lord has made it the door to new life. And there is life after death. And there is full forgiveness uh, of sin with Jesus. And that's the good news of the gospel. And that is the major message of, of um, the gospel, the account of Luke and Matthew, Matthew uh, telling us about the nativity of our Lord. I love this idea of the symmetry, that the, the, the very birth of Jesus, the providence by which God arranged all of those circumstances of his birth, were clearly intended to foresee his death. That means that Christ was born, his purpose in being born, God so loved the world that he gave this precious son, that he would suffer death in order to overcome death for us. And that that message, which is proclaimed throughout all of his life, is, is decisively proclaimed in his death on the cross and his resurrection, which is like a new birth. Interestingly, the Lord is, uh, we're told by Paul, that Adam was a type, a figure of Christ who was to come. And we recall that Adam had no mother. He only had father, uh, God, and that the womb of Adam was really Mother Earth. God took Adam from the womb of the earth, and after, after that, uh, after his unique birth from the earth, um, the rest of Scripture regards the earth as the womb of man. Uh, we see that in Job when he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I returned there. And he, he is not talking like a Nicodemus that he would return to the womb of his mother. He is talking about he came into the world with nothing, naked, and he will leave with nothing. He can take nothing with him when he makes that marvelous affirmation, blessed be the name of the Lord. But when he says, naked I return there, he's speaking of his birth in, or rather his death and his burial. He is going to be interred. He's going to be laid in the womb of mankind. And um, David refers to something similar when he's, he speaks of his being, uh, God weaving his embryo together in his mother's womb in the darkest place of the earth. And he uses the, the language of making this beautiful oriental tapestry and weaving the human body, which is such a wonder when we think of all of the strands, the, the, the veins, the arteries, all of the way that God creates this beauty in our system and weaving it all together. And, and um, it's like David is marveling in Psalm 139 of the artistry of God. He can make this beautiful creation of uh, a man or a woman in the womb. Uh, he is a great artist. He does it completely in darkness. He doesn't need the light to create that beautiful, beautiful picture of the symmetry of the human body. And then when we come to the New Testament, that point is driven home by Paul in Romans 8 when he describes the resurrection of the last day and he says the earth, the ancient womb of Adam will be in labor and travail to bring forth the sons of, of man, the children of God. The, uh, when we are called forth from 
like Adam from the, from the dust of the ground. As Daniel remarks, we who sleep in the dust of the earth will be awakened by the Savior who promises to, to reconstitute our bodies and to uh, reunite our souls with our bodies so that we might have eternal life in a perfect body, a body made like unto Jesus' own body. That's the gospel, and all of that is the free gift of God. And so our lives, uh, David talks in Psalm 139 about, he's written in a book, there is, there is plan, there is purpose, all of the days of our lives. And I, I think we find that there is a beautiful symmetry to the, to the pattern of life. And there, it, there is clearly design, there is purpose. There is, that's all part of this glorious good news that we have. And we see it in Jesus, this precious Son of God, the only truly sinless, holy, harmless, undefiled Son of God that the Father gave to the world, gave to us, that anyone who believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And he is the one who suffered and died on our behalf to take away the wrath of God that we, we in justice re deserve for our sins. He took that penalty away from us, and then he promises us to give us new life and to give us his own righteous character. He is raised for our justification. And so he suffered death on the cross, but then he was awakened by the Father because the principle of life in him was indestructible, and so he came forth, uh, and as it were, in a new birth, being born from the ancient womb of Adam, coming forth from the earth, uh, carved into the earth, and he then offers us the promise that that too can anticipate our own resurrection when we are born again uh, on the day of resurrection when we are born from, from the womb of the earth with all of mankind, all of the redeemed who have trusted in Christ for that great and glorious salvation. So we can trust that there is a pattern, there's a purpose, that God who does all things well is working in a, a beauty in us. He is creating. Every day has been ordained to create in us the kind of character that he delights in. We are being conformed to the very image of Christ uh, himself so that the Father will delight in us even as he delights in the Son. It's just a marvelous, beautiful picture of the gospel. And that's the good news that was preached at the first Christmas and then was the message truly of the, the last Christmas of the, in this history of redemption, and that was the birth of Jesus uh, when he was born in resurrection. Those two Christmases, as the whole message of the gospel is in, enveloped, is, is embraced by, by the life of the Savior, truly he was given to conquer death itself and to uh, overcome both death and sin for us, and that's the message, that's the true message. And if you can see the sign if you can see the sign of the shepherd and believe that truly he was given to overcome death, then your promise is that you will have everlasting life, and that's the message of Christmas. Father, we thank you that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten precious Son, our Savior, that you gave him, the darling of heaven, for our sin. We cannot imagine how you could love us so much but we measure your love by the gift that you gave, and it is beyond our comprehension. We thank you for that precious gift, and we ask, Lord, that we would be like those faithful pastors and shepherds, that we would go forth into all the earth, telling every, everyone everywhere this glorious message of the Son of God who came to deliver the world from death and sin. We thank you for that message, that that message has been given to us, not only to believe, but to proclaim. And we have the privilege of preaching the gospel in all the world and giving the world that is still in darkness the hope of a great light. We thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Gracias uh, por la mar maravillosa palabra. Y damos gracias otra vez a Dios por las grandes bendiciones. Gracias a todos. Y ahora, uh, Pastora Julisa uh, nos presentará el Seminario de Berit.
en detalle. Uh, Pastora Julissa. Muchas gracias, Pastor Josh. Muchos saludos. Por aquí me toca presentar la parte del, del seminario, de cómo usted debe de aplicar para el seminario. Pero antes de esto, voy a estar hablando un poco sobre lo que estaba hablando quizás Sandra al comienzo de, del seminario. Usted que quizás se está conectando en este instante, en este momento quizás no escuchó anteriormente. Eh, nuestro seminario, ¿verdad? El fundador es el reverendo Abraham Park. Y el reverendo, el reverendo Abraham Park, él leyó la Biblia más de 1800 veces. Y estas son las enseñanzas que usted va a estar recibiendo en este seminario teológico Verí. Eh, no son enseñanzas que quizás usted eh, las pueda tomar por sentado. Son enseñanzas que van muy a profundidad. Así es que yo le voy a estar guiando a usted que quizás está poniéndonos los mensajes que quiere más información de cómo usted puede buscar más información y cómo usted puede registrarse o llenar la hoja de inscripción o de solicitud de admisión. Así es que por favor, eh, next. Evangelista Sofía. ¿Cómo aplicar el seminario Berit? Bueno, el seminario Berit es completamente en línea, así que usted puede conectarse de cualquier parte del mundo. Eh, yo sé que hay muchas personas que quizás se conectan de diferentes partes, especialmente de Venezuela, y estamos bregando cuando estamos trabajando con usted para ver cómo podemos alcanzar allá para poderle llevar las lecciones. Así que usted está siendo bendecido a través de, esta, de este seminario teológico. Eh, ofrecemos diferentes programas académicos, ofrecemos el doctorado del ministerio, un doctorado en, también en estudios bíblicos, también ofrecemos maestría de divinidad, ofrecemos maestría en estudios bíblicos, eh, también tenemos licenciado en estudios bíblicos y una de las cosas que quizás muchas personas cuando están eh, preguntando por más información es que muchas personas a veces tienen la imagen de que quizás no van a poder estudiar porque quizás no tienen ningún tipo de estudios. Bueno, pues aquí tenemos el programa de certificación. Así que si usted es una persona que quizás está comenzando y usted quiere aprender más sobre la palabra de Dios detalladamente, entonces usted puede eh, completar su solicitud para el programa de certificación. ¿Cómo usted llena estos documentos? Estos documentos son completamente en línea. Dado el caso, sabemos que hay personas que quizás no pueden llenarlos en línea porque su acceso al Internet es muy limitado. Entonces, usted simplemente se tiene que poner con nuestras oficinas, se pone en contacto con esta servidora, Yulisa Santiago, es la persona encargada de la oficina de admisiones. Así que cuando usted se contacta por los mensajes del WhatsApp, muchas veces estamos hablando, ¿verdad? Eh, comunicándonos. Y yo le estoy enviando la solicitud en papel. Entonces, cuando usted llegue esta solicitud, usted simplemente la llena, la completa y nos las envía para atrás. Pero, ¿cómo usted va a llenar esta solicitud si usted lo hace en línea? Es importante que cuando usted llene la aplicación en línea, usted trate de llenar todo lo más, la información que usted más pueda. Y obviamente en esa información se requieren algunos documentos. Por ejemplo, cuando usted solicita, se le solicita una autobiografía. Y hay personas que me contactan y me dicen, ay, pero yo no sé lo que es una autobiografía. Entonces simplemente contáctenos con nosotros, nosotros le podemos guiar para que usted pueda crear su autobiografía. Y en esa autobiografía, obviamente, como nuestra academia, nuestro seminario teológico está ofreciendo eh, becas estudiantiles, es allí donde usted puede eh, informarnos sobre su necesidad eh, financiera, ¿verdad? Para entonces poder aplicar para su, su, su beca estudiantil. Eh, ¿Qué otro documento necesita? Aparte de la autobiografía, usted también va a necesitar enviar sus, transcri sus transcripciones de crédito. Estas son todas las instituciones educativas que quizás usted eh, atendió en el pasado. Pues obviamente necesitamos las que son oficiales, pero si usted no tiene a la mano las transcripciones de crédito que son oficiales, entonces nos puede enviar las que no son oficiales por el momento. ¿okay? Otra de las cosas que necesitamos es la carta de recomendación. Una carta de recomendación de la persona más cercana a usted, eh, si preferiblemente de, de, de su pastor o de su líder religioso en su, en su lugar donde usted se congrega, eh, necesitaríamos entonces una carta de recomendación. Esto debe, esta, esta, estos documentos deben estar juntos con su solicitud de inscripción, inscripción. ¿Cómo usted los puede solicitar? Bueno, si usted está haciendo la aplicación a través del internet, le va a dar eh, el espacio para usted poder adjuntar estos documentos. Pero si usted lo está haciendo vía los documentos que tiene que imprimir eh, y poderlo llenar en papel, entonces nos los enviaría a nuestras oficinas a través del correo electrónico. Aquí tienen en la pantalla el correo electrónico que es admin.berit.us. 
Así que lo tienen por aquí en la pantalla. Pueden tomar nota para que nos envíen los documentos. Sé que quizás no tengan la solicitud en papel, pero nos pueden contactar vía un mensaje aquí mismo. Eh, no nos pueden dejar en un comentario y entonces nosotros nos, nos haremos cargo para enviarles su solicitud. Eh, próximo. Next, Evangelis. Evangelita Sofía. ¿Cuál es el proceso de, de admisión? Bueno, pues ya les estaba comentando, tienen que iniciar su solicitud. Eh, ese sería el primer paso. El segundo paso es presentar la recomendación pastoral. Esa es la carta que les había explicado anteriormente. Y el tercer paso es enviar sus transcripciones de crédito. Ese sería el proceso de admisión. Es algo muy fácil, no es algo muy tedioso. Lo importante es que usted trate de eh, llenar la documentación necesaria, todo lo, lo que usted tenga listo. Si, no tiene, si hay algo que usted no tiene en el momento, le pedimos que por favor llene su solicitud y ya tan pronto tenga su documentación, nos las hace llegar a través del correo electrónico. Next. Y es importante que a través de este tiempo, que sabemos que hay muchas personas que se están conectando de diferentes naciones, quizás no todo el mundo ¿verdad? pueda tener eh, las herramientas para poder estudiar en el seminario. Eh, si usted es una de las personas que quiere apoyarnos en nuestro seminario a través de quizás adoptar a un estudiante, nosotros ofrecemos becas estudiantiles a diferentes estudiantes que quizás tengan la necesidad de, de, de una beca estudiantil ten, y tiene el anhelo de querer estudiar, pero quizás no tiene los fondos financieros. Entonces, si usted es una persona que quizás no se va a inscribir en el seminario, ¿verdad? Pero quizás sí tiene las herramientas para poder apoyar a alguien eh, apoyándole financieramente como adoptar a un estudiante para que ese estudiante pueda lograr el anhelo de su corazón de aprender más de la palabra de Dios. Entonces necesitamos que usted se contacte con nosotros para que nos haga llegar, para poder llegar, hacer llegar la información para que usted, entonces se pueda, pueda apoyarnos de esta manera. Algunas personas preguntan, ¿cómo entonces si quizás yo no tengo... Eh, Nada financiero, no, no tengo mis finanzas quizás en orden para poder costear un seminario, o un seminario teológico. ¿Cómo entonces yo pudiera enviar mi, mi solicitud de admisión? Bueno, contamos con el programa que se llama Adoptar a un estudiante. Entonces, lo que significa es que nosotros vamos a estar evaluando su situación al usted enviarnos su solicitud de admisión. Entonces, por eso es importante que si usted tiene el anhelo en su corazón, verdaderamente de comenzar este nuevo año en la primavera. Vamos a estar comenzando en el mes de marzo el seminario teológico en español. Entonces usted, usted todavía tiene un poco de tiempo para enviarnos la solicitud y cuando usted nos envía la solicitud, nosotros vamos a evaluar cada solicitud que ha llegado. Entonces de acuerdo a las becas estudiantiles que tenemos, entonces serían entregadas. Pero si usted es una persona que quizás no va a, a inscribirse en el seminario y usted cuenta con, la, con, con, con los datos financieros para apoyar a un estudiante, entonces le invitamos a que apoye al seminario teológico para que así la palabra pueda ser proclamada, pueda ser enseñada y pueda seguir expandiéndose a cada nación. Eh, no sé si tenemos aquí algunas preguntas. Yo sé que alguna, una persona preguntó algo en vivo y era que deseaba más información. Por favor, al cerrar esta transmisión, simplemente dejen los comentarios abajo para que de esta manera nosotros podamos responderle con la información detallada a su privado. Muchas gracias y hasta pronto. Bien, gracias, Pastora Julisa, por una explicación detallada del seminario Beriet. Ahora, antes de concluir el seminario, uh, terminemos con la oración de Padre Nuestro. Okay. So, vamos a orar juntos. Padre Nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre, venga a nosotros tu reino, hágase tu voluntad en la tierra como en el cielo. Danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día, perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. No nos dejes caer en la tentación y libranos del mal, porque tuyo es el reino, el poder y la, la gloria por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Gracias a todos. Si tienen algún comentario sobre el seminario virtual o su sermón, uh, por favor, comparte con nosotros, nosotros ahora. ¿Alguien? Ok. Entonces, ahora, uh, si no, then ahora esto concluye el seminario virtual del Seminario Teológico de Berit. Dios te bendiga y vamos a uh, saludar. Feliz. Navidad con todos, ¿ok?
Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Gracias a todos. Nos vemos la próxima vez. Okay, I stopped the live streaming. Any comments?